Hey, good morning, my friend. This is Pastor Gerald Wheaton. I uh, hope and pray uh, that your day is going well. No, it's kind of early in the morning, uh, but we thank the Lord for yet another beautiful day. Now, let me say this quickly. On yesterday, I made a post uh, speaking to the issue of unity within the family of God. I had two passages of the scripture uh, that I posted, and one scripture came out of the book of Ephesians, and it spoke in reference uh, to the church. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, and we're just going to take one piece out of the verse, but in Ephesians 4 and 4, Paul says these words. He says, there is one body. Uh, I want you to know that there is only one body. Uh, the church of this dispensation is called the body of Christ, and there is only one body. You're either a member of the body, being in Christ, or you are yet in Adam. And so understand there is one body. Now, the other verse that I brought came out of the book of Psalms. And it's the 133rd number of Psalms, uh, verse 1, and it goes something like this. The writer says, how good, well, excuse me, he says, behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. You know, we like that word unity. We don't see a lot of it, uh, but we love the word unity. And, you know, the question that is asked is, why is there so much division in the professing church today? Is there uh, a scriptural answer uh, to the division? Well, yes, there is. Uh, and that is what I would like to address on today. Now, let me say this. Uh, I have three points that I would like for you to consider uh, as we go into God's word, talking about this issue of division in the church. And these are the three points. Uh, it says, number one, what we believe about the church. Number two, lack of obedience to the head, which is Jesus Christ. And then lastly, lack of of humility among the saints. Now, these are three points. I'm sure we could have come up with a whole lot more, but just beginning here with these three points, an understanding of each will give us uh, insight as to why uh, there is division or confusion. Now, our word for today is the word unity. Uh, that word unity uh, speaks to oneness. You know, a lot of times we say when it comes to the church, if we can just all get on the same page or if we can all just be on one accord, uh, then we can get some things done. But when we look at the professing church today, it seems that the church is being pulled in so many different directions. And the reason for that is that because a lot of the times we don't have God's best interest at heart. You have to understand that just as God has a will, so does man. Let me give you a simple definition of, of what it means uh, for the church uh, to be united or for the church to be on one accord. And, and, and this is simple. Uh, let's say you got a building and you put a hundred people in that building. Well, I want you to understand you put a hundred people in that building and you got a, you probably got a hundred people with different minds. You got a hundred people. They all have different wheels. Uh, and when they get in the building, uh, each one is fighting for supremacy over the other. And so what you have is a lot of pulling back and forth as to what the direction the church should go in, 
uh, what the church should be teaching, how the church should respond to the community. You got all of these different mindsets, and there seems to be chaos. Now, let me simplify that for you. God has a will. God has a will. And God's intent is that he can get those hundred people to forego their own wills, humble themselves to his will. It is when we humble ourselves to him and we accept what God says about a thing, when we yield ourselves to that is then that we can have a hundred people all thinking the same thing, all doing the same thing. We can be united in our understanding and we can get some things done. You know, two passages of scripture that come to mind that can help us with that. You know, in the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. I won't read the whole verse. I'll just give you a little bit of what the verse says. But in Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, Paul is praying a prayer. And the prayer is this. He prays uh, that we all come to the fullness of God's will. He says, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So I want you to understand that when it comes to the will of God, well, first of all, there's some things that we have to know. We have to know how God sees a thing or what God says about a thing. It can't be my mind. It can't be my understanding. It has to be his. And then the other thing in the book of Philippians chapter two, verse five, Paul says these words concerning the saints. Uh, he, he's, he puts it like this. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, the reason that I like that verse is the word mind does not have an S on it. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so as we are yielded to God, wanting to know what he says, uh, what his word says about a thing, it's then uh, that we can be on one accord. But as long as we're fighting for our way, as long as we are fighting for our supposed understanding about a thing apart from uh, the scripture or apart from what God says on a thing, well, there's always going to be confusion. Now, the three points, uh, an understanding of these three points can help us uh, when it comes to the word of God. And, and the, the first thing that we're going to look at is, is this. What do we believe about the church? Now, let me say this. We have to address what the church is not before we can actually say what it is. And so let me say this uh, to a lot of our listeners. When we use the word church, uh, it's not talking about a building. Uh, it's not talking about a place that we go to. It's not talking about a denominational system formed by man, I, I want you to understand that all of those mindsets lead uh, to division and lead to confusion. So we must know what is the church. What is the church? Now, it's been said by some that we are the church. Well, that's a half truth. The Bible gives clear and definite understanding as to what it is. And so I've got two passages of scripture that I want to give you. And we're, we're not going to uh, go super in-depth on it. Uh, I just want you to see some things on the surface. And as time goes on and we get deeper into this study, uh, we will uh, give more understanding, uh, a deeper understanding, that is, uh, to the text. So I'd like for you to go with me this morning to the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 18. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. Now, notice what Paul says that the church is, and I want you to underline it in your Bible. And so, beginning with verse 18, 
Paul speaks concerning Christ being the head of the body. Now, notice what he says in the verse. In verse 18, it says this, and he is the head of the body. Now, underline the next few words. The church. He is the head of the body. And then he tells you what the body is, the church. And so we learn from the text that the church is called the body of Christ, and Christ is the head. Now, turn to Ephesians chapter 1, to where Paul is going to say the same thing. Now, I don't want you to get any more from the text other than Christ is the head of the body, and the body is called the church. So in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 22 and 23, we find the same things. And notice what it says. It says, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him, meaning Christ, to be the head over all things to the church. Underline the next few words in verse 23, which is his body. And so we see in the text that the church is the body of Christ. It is not a building. It is not a denominational system. Uh, when it comes to the word of God, there is no such thing as a Baptist church or a Catholic church or a Methodist church or a church of Christ. Uh, you won't find those words in scripture because the name, the name of of the church or the called out of God is the body of Christ. Now, the word church has a meaning and a simple definition of the word church is simply this, the called out. I want you to understand that when it comes to God's word, God has always had a church, whether we're in the Old Testament and the Old Testament speaks of Israel, the nation of Israel, as being the church in the wilderness. That word church simply means the called out. And so when we go back into our Old Testament scripture, we can see the story of how God called Abraham. And we can see how God called Moses. And Moses goes into the land of Egypt and he calls the Jews out of Egyptian bondage with the hope of going to a promised land. Well, I want you to understand that in this dispensation of grace, God has a church or God has a call out. And so once again, when we think of the word church, it's not a building and it's not something you join. You know, in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, Paul says, uh, when he speaks in reference to those that are people of God, he said, the call according to his purpose. Uh, if you are in the body of Christ, you are one of those that are called according to the purpose and grace of God all. Mighty. It's not about a building, but it is about you being in a spiritual body in which Christ is the head. Now, another passage of scripture, and I really like this one, is found in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 9. And this verse, it speaks to those who are part of the family of God. And so notice what it says, 2 Timothy chapter 1, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 1, looking at verse 9, listen to what Paul says as he speaks in reference to the saints. Concerning God, he says this, who hath saved us, here it is now, and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. 
The other thing that we learn uh, about the church is that there is only one church. Uh, there's not two. There's not three. Uh, there's only one. Now, I know that just in the town of Willis and New Waverly, uh, there are uh, churches on every street corner. But, you know, that's not what God is talking about. Uh, when God speaks about the body of Christ, once again, it's not a building, uh, but it is Christ's own body. And so there is only one, just one. Now, one of the verses that I posted on yesterday was Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. Uh, and in the text, Paul says there is one body. That there's not only one body, but we even understand that there is only one spirit. Now, in Colossians chapter 3, uh, verse 15, Paul speaks to the issue of oneness. He says that the saints are to be thankful because they are called into, here it is, one body. That would be Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, Paul says these words. For by one spirit were we all baptized into, here it is, one body. 